the agenda is set. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Today on the show, a king for a change. The Dutch and their monarch. How something very old suddenly feels very modern. That and more today. It's time to talk. Also on the show, chemical weapons in Syria. U.S. President Obama for the first time saying chemical weapons may have been used there. Today we ask, what does the U.S. and the world do now? In Bangladesh, they make many of the clothes that we buy at rock bottom prices. But some of those textile workers lose their lives trying to make a living. Hundreds of workers died when this garment factory collapsed last week. Who should be held responsible? And how many people have to die in order to ensure that this huge industry is no longer a death trap? And in party mode, a wash in a sea of orange, the Netherlands is celebrating a new man on the throne. A prince becomes king. Willem Alexander takes the scepter of power from his mother, Queen Beatrix. A sovereign transition at the stroke of a pen and a nation in love with its royals. Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest says that his people love the monarchy so much that the thought of having a president well, sends them running for the crown. I'm happy to welcome to the show Jürgen Eisvogel. He is a Dutch journalist on assignment here in Berlin. That's quite a statement to make, Mr. Eisvogel. Um, you're busy explaining the love of the, uh, for the royals um, here in Germany, explaining that, what's going on in your own country. How is it that the Netherlands can be so modern, can be so open, and at the same time be in love with royalty. It's probably because so many things are changing already in this day and age that this one symbol of continuity and Dutchness is cherished. Okay, well, we're going to talk about cherishing that in just a moment. Glad to have you on the show. My second guest has played a significant role in showing the world the ugly face of Bangladesh's garment industry. I'm happy to welcome to the show today Hanan Mayid. He is a Bangladeshi British filmmaker. Um, he's done several films. He's got a new one coming out um, on Bangladesh that we're going to talk about in just a moment. But Hanan, this is an industry where people are forced to work when they know that all of the walls around them are about to collapse at any time, basically. Who is responsible here? Uh, I would say... Uh the factory owners, factory owners are one of the biggest culprits. I'd say the government needs to take responsibility and also the brands, i.e. Primark, uh, Zara, any of these, Mango, they need to take responsibility as well. They can't think that, you know, we're just going to put in an order and then, you know, walk away from it and think that if anything happens in those buildings, that it's not our responsibility. Okay. So, I would say th th those are the th things that I'd like to talk about. All right. We're going we're gonna to talk about culpability in yeah. just a moment. Glad to have you on the show. And... My next guest says we should check our colors when we talk about a red line being crossed in the Syrian civil war. I'm happy to welcome to the show Markus Keim. He is from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. He's one of Europe's leading geopolitical analysts. Mr. Keim, despite the report of possible chemical weapons being used in Syria, it really doesn't feel like the U.S. or the international community are any closer to taking action in Syria. Why is that? I think uh, for two reasons. First, um, we still do not have really credible evidence, credible proof of what had what has happened in Aleppo and uh, and Damascus on, on March 19th. Actually, we would need soil, we would need blood samples and other things which are simply not available because we do not have an UN, de uh, UN delegation uh, on the ground in Syria. Mm -hmm. And the th second thing is, uh, I think, um, what is described by the US as a healthy skepticism towards the events in, in, in Syria actually is um, uh, uh, an, an effort to avoid any international action. All right, yeah, healthy skepticism. That's an interesting way to put it. In the Syrian crisis, no one wants to be accused of making the same Iraq mistakes. And that means intelligence has to be reliable, and that means telling people 
the truth. Now, that seems so simple, yet it is incredibly difficult to do. Damascus is not inviting inspectors to look up its weapon skirt. The White House is at pains right now not to sound any alarms. And so far, we know that the U.S. has reason to believe the Assad regime has probably used chemical weapons on Syrian soil. The language is so cautious that it leaves us basically where we have been all along, on a course of watch and see. So the question is, is that about to change? Obviously horrific. As President it is. Barack Obama called it the red line for U.S. intervention. Now that line appears to have been crossed. As the conflict in Syria drags on, evidence is mounting that the regime has used the deadly nerve agent sarin against rebel fighters. Although U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel admitted there was some uncertainty. That the U.S. intelligence community assesses with some degree of varying confidence that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on a small scale in Syria. According to U.S. intelligence, the Syrian military has likely used sarin on at least two occasions in the civil war. Senator John McCain says the president must now stick by his vow to take action. President, in the situation in Syria is unacceptable. The president of the United States said that this would be a red line if they used chemical weapons. The president of the United States has now told us that they used chemical weapons. As the country's civil war rages, the question of military intervention by the West now seems more acute than ever. Yeah, we see right there, Mr. Kaim, that um, even when you talk about chemical weapons in Washington, it becomes very political. Um, are we any closer, though, to, to seeing Washington move in terms of, of, of acting in Syria? I mean, the crucial question is what does it mean, the use of chemical, of chemical weapons in Syria? Uh, we had two minor incidents, a small scale. Um, uh, it, it did not kill um, uh, so many civilians as a, as a usual chemical weapons attack, uh, as we have seen it in the past. So the question is, is really the red line a red line, and has it been crossed? And again, uh, I think all reports, uh, the first one came in by the Israeli government, then by the British and the French governments, all have been very careful uh, and very reluctant to draw any uh, operational military conclusions from that. And, and, and what's interesting is the world is talking not so much about the use of chemical weapons right now, more so about this red line that Obama mentioned. Has he put, painted himself into a box by listing this as a criteria? for basically taking military action? I think he has created a, maybe a, a trap um, uh, for himself. On the one, or he has, he's facing a dilemma. On the one hand, uh, there's an, a growing inward-looking mo mode in the U.S. politics. Nobody has an interest to get involved uh, in any military engagement in the Middle East uh, um, uh, by aerial strikes or by, by boots on the ground. But on the other, on the other hand, he has, uh, he has committed it's himself personally with mentioning the red lines mm -hmm. that the U.S. one day would be engaged militarily leading the international community. So it has become a question of personal credibility for him. And on a mid- and long-term perspective, the same case could be applied to Iran uh, after he has announced, President Obama, that, uh, that um, crossing a red line would also mean that the, uh, the, if, if Iran would go nuclear in the, in the foreseeable future, that would be also crossing a red line. But this use of the red line is, is actually... Um, he's giving something to the rebels in Syria, isn't he? Um, because... Once he said that, the rebels then had as a goal to prove that chemical weapons have been used. So he's almost forcing this issue by saying that is a red line. Maybe not forcing, but uh, I think uh, um, you're right. He has given some leverage uh, to others. So it's not only a question of a decision by the U.S., but also um, leverage of others. And I think it's pretty obvious uh, that the U.S. is preparing for some, um, some incidents, maybe not tomorrow, but uh, in, the, in the next weeks or month to come in the context of the final fall of the Assad regime. And what about that preparing, Mr. Kahn? Because we know that the Pentagon has sent in troops mm -hmm. into Jordan, for example, and, and these troops... Um, they're not ground troops. They're what they're referred to as as headquarter <laughs> troops. But 
um, it's important to note that if these troops are in an area, they basically pave the way for any type of military intervention that could come. I mean, that's a significant move by the Pentagon. Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a um, command structure to, to prepare a, a, a bigger military operation. And it should say, should, I think it, it's, uh, at least currently, it's intended to send different political signals, mm. um, and political signals to the international community to, as to public opinion in the U.S. as well. S somehow we do something from a U.S. perspective. It sends signals to the regional allies of the U.S. We do not leave you alone, be it, be it Jordan, be it uh, Saudi Arabia, be it Israel. And it sends a signal to the uh, Assad regime, um, don't, don't be too sure that we do not uh, get in, uh, engaged militarily. Yeah, I mean, basically you're saying we've got troops right on your back doorstep now. Absolutely. You're Absolutely. basically almost surrounded by the U.S. or by Western troops. Absolutely. If you take into consideration the, the uh, um, Patriot missile defense facilities right. in uh, northern Turkey, you have, you have Western troops already in the north of Syria as well as in the south, uh, southern. It's basically the U.S. that has been chiming in when we're talking about any type of intervention. Um, we're not hearing much from Europe. I mean, we did have David Cameron coming in saying that um, basically that Great Britain is behind the White House on this. But, I mean, I'll bring in the other gentleman as well. Basically, Europe is very quiet about something that um, strategically is actually much more important. I mean, Syria is basically Europe's back door. Mm -hmm. You could look at it that way. Um, why... Is, why is Europe being so silent now? I mean, the first point is pretty obvious. Europe is simply divided on, on Syria. Uh, one case, um, or particular case, is a question of arms embargo um, uh, uh, with regard to the Syrian rebels. Uh, and there's a huge disagreement among um, Great Britain and France on the one side and the, basically the other European powers on the other side, uh, if the arms embargo should be extended at the end of May. But uh, in general, um, the European um, uh, Common and for Foreign and Security Policy does not play any major role in this Syria case. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge di disgrace for Europe um, after, after having pretended for 20 years now that we are a major player in the European neighborhood and the Middle East is part of the European neighborhood. But also I think you should notice that we talk about intervention and in the United States there's a lot of talk of intervention but nobody really knows what an intervention would look like that would really stop the use of chemical weapons or that would make this, this terrible situation any better. I mean, there are possibilities. I mean, some people have talked about a no-fly zone, for example, over uh, Syria. Um, but, Hanan, I'll bring you in. You, um, you know, you're in the business of doing documentaries. You, you've been in countries where people suffer at the hands of what the state is doing, for example. We see that going on now. We've been seeing that now for two years in Syria. And yet, from outside, nothing basically is happening. See, that I, you, you, kind of see, you kind of see Europe and even uh, the Americans, uh, uh, why they're a bit reluctant to go in. I think they, it, it, if, you, if you look at uh, recently where, they, where they've been, there's no, uh, there's no case where they've actually gone in and they've improved, uh, they've improved the situation. So I, you, can, you can understand their reluctance. And uh, so uh, I, th I, I personally think as well that I think the evidence really isn't there right right now uh, for them to for them for them to go in. I don't think, and I don't, I can't see that happening either. I can't see them going in in, in a rush. John McCain might he can say whatever he wants, yeah. but I can't see. I really can't see that happening. I mean, I know if, when when I talk to people mm -hmm. in in Washington, they all say you know that Obama is terrified now of of becoming the next George W. Yeah. Bush, which mm -hmm. is why he he is a fetishist mm -hmm. for the truth mm -hmm. in, in this case, Mr. Kaim, You've um, said that the appropriate time to act militarily would have been a year ago. Mm -hmm. Why? I think uh, one year ago the scenario would, wouldn't have, the Syria scenario wouldn't have looked like Iran, uh, Iraq sorry, or Afghanistan, but f would have uh, or could have looked like, for example, like Libya, mm -hmm. or even, you know, even better comparison, um, um, the Balkans in the 1990s, mm -hmm. in which um, 
it's rather small scale military engagement. I'm not talking about invasion here. Engagement, airstrikes, no fly zone could have been very effective. Uh, without a political um, uh, purpose or with a p clear political goal, yeah. but simply with the goal of end the slaughtering, um, like in the Kosovo in 1999. But I think this this point is has been or the, the point of no return has been has, has but, but why would a no-fly zone not help now because obviously the rebels they can't compete with the Assad regime's military when it when it comes to, to air capability and th that superiority would be stopped if you had a no-fly zone yeah one year ago you had a very clear-cut division in the labor rather clear-cut on the one hand the the rebels or the opposition on the one hand the Assad regime and now and what has happened in the in the in the last year is that the that the uh, opposition has been has been become way more blurred the islamists uh, have have entered the country or the islamist rebels uh, the international jihadists have entered the country uh, have taken yeah, ha have taken Hezbollah. sides hezbollah as well so yep. it has become more internationalized than one year ago and that has led to a situation in which conflict maybe not resolution, but conflict management, have become way more difficult than one year ago. You, you've also said that everyone outside of Syria has, uh, has been delegitimized um, through all of this waiting. Russia, China, of course, at the UN Security Council, um, they're not going to vote for anything to happen. The rest of the members of the um, UN Security Council in the U.S., they're delegitimized, uh, partly because of this language, this red line language, mm -hmm. which it, it seems like the rhetoric is there, but the action will never come. So what is going to happen then, Mr. Kime? I mean, what do you see in the crystal ball? I mean, most people say that if nothing happens, you're going to have a civil war that's going to go on for years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we don't even want to predict how many more people will have to die. I think the, uh, the, the skeptics towards a military intervention or a military engagement are in so far right um, when they point to the question, the, uh, the unintended consequences. Uh, you never know who you're really arming. But uh, in a mid and long term perspective, we're facing even more unintended consequences. If Syria, not as a territorial entity, but as a political entity, it will simply dissolve, will, f will fall apart uh, with um, uh, consequences I know, uh, I, I, I do not even dare to think about, uh, with maybe even destabilizing effects on other countries in the region. Uh, and that would really affect the interests of all international parties involved. Yeah, I mean, I think the first time when we talked on this show about the situation in Syria, uh, most people were thinking in a year or so, we would be talking about action haven't already been taken, and of course now we're two years into it and nothing has happened yet. So I'm sure we'll be talking about this again at some point in the not-so-distant future. All right, let's move on. Um, it is an unprecedented tragedy in Bangladesh. Around 400 people died when a garments factory collapsed last week, and that number is expected to rise. More bodies will probably be discovered as heavy equipment moves in to remove the rubble. The UK retailer Primark and the Canadian retailer Loblaws have both announced that they will pay compensation to the survivors of the victims and also to the victims' relatives. But they are not taking responsibility for the disaster. In fact, no one is standing up and saying the protection of the workers lies with me. The owner of the factory even tried to flee the country. It was the worst disaster ever to hit Bangladesh's garment industry. For days, firefighters combed the rubble for survivors. Many using their bare hands, emergency workers tried to pull people from the ruins. Rescuers have now all but given up hope of finding anyone else alive. Over 380 have been killed and hundreds are still unaccounted for. A day before the collapse, workers felt a jolt and discovered cracks appearing in the structure. Several businesses in the same building evacuated, but the garment factories on the upper floors told their employees it was safe to go in. Police have arrested six people in connection with the collapse. The owner of the building was apprehended trying to flee to India. He had planning permission for a five-story building, but added an extra three floors illegally. Anger is growing over conditions for Bangladesh's three and a half million garment workers. People here say it's time to increase safety standards and hold those in charge accountable. Hanan Majid, let me bring you in to talk uh, about this. Who needs to come up and say we are responsible for what happened? 
I think definitely uh, the, the owner of the factory is one of the biggest culprits here. I'd say uh, the government needs to, needs to really needs to look at themselves. He, you know, you, you talked over there just on the, uh, the uh, uh, three extra floors were made, but why were three extra floors made? How come that wasn't checked on? You know, uh, how can you just make three extra floors and then nobody comes and says, well, hold on, there was three extra floors well, made. Well, how can you do beige. that? I mean, you've been, you've been well, in the country. Well, government inspections, for, for starters. Mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> but I don't know if you, you know, you may know this, that uh, these, this, this guy who owned the Rana factory, he was totally in cahoots with the government. You know, and whether it be the Awami League, which is the current party, or whether it be the BNP, which is the previous party, mm -hmm. you know, he plays with both of them. And that's not just... Well, what do you mean when you say he plays with both of them? Is he a contributor um, to the parties, it, it, or...? Th this is what I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, because they, they need to be in cahoots to be able to get the, to be able to get the uh, permits, to be able to make these factories. He doesn't just own that factory, he's got quite, quite a few more. You know, a few months ago, he'd, ma he'd made some more as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, now what the government really needs to be doing is looking at those factories as well. I was just talking to one of my, uh, one of my, my friends who's, uh, who featured in the film that we did about the garment workers, mm -hmm. and she was telling me the factory that she's working in has got cracks as well. You know, the buildings are the same. You know, and I just, just, just before we, we started shooting here, mm -hmm. I was talking to one of the other garment workers who was in the film, and they're saying, that they're saying the same. So you can see the pattern there. And then just, just last year, there was a factory fire, 112 12 people died. It was the Tazin factory fire. Right. And, you know, they, they were producing clothes for Walmart uh, and uh, Primark, uh, but really they were producing clothes for Walmart. Just a few months previous to that, another factory fire, and not even that long before that, so that you can see the pattern. You and, know, and nothing, and nothing. You know, no one has been prosecuted for that. Um, no, no one is getting. No one is getting. No one is getting prosecuted for that because it's that industry makes so much money for the country that they don't want to. They don't want to rock the boat. If okay. you know, if you know what I mean. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the power of the industry in just a moment. But we've got a clip of your film, The Machinist, that we want to show. And here you show an attempt of the workers trying to organize to protect themselves. Let's show you that clip. <laughs> and you know there we see workers um, who are organizing they want to take action against their bosses basically but we also have to mention in Bangladesh there are unions yes, in the garment industry why aren't they doing anything they are they are the, the unions are very much doing th something uh, they, they got, they're getting people together they're doing protest movements uh, you know uh, j just this weekend I'll give you an example after after, after this tragedy uh, the government gave the uh, workers the weekend off so they didn't they, you know they didn't go to work or, uh, in the factories over the weekend and then they were supposed to go back to work on Monday, but they all went back to work and walked straight back out in protest. And why? Because they want something done with it because of what's happened with this new building. With this, building with this new building, and you said you've, you've talked to people over yeah. there and they've told you that in their factories they see also cracks exactly. in the walls. And is anything happening? Are they still being well, told, no, you have to work? Well, that's it. Well, you know, with this, the Rana factory, uh, just the day before, they, that building was evacuated. And then the, the following day, the factory owners, they, they, uh, they forced the workers to come back in. Mm -hmm. They said, either you come back in or your wages are going to get docked. And so they came back in. And, well, you know, when they, when, they give, when they scare them like that, when they'll say your wages are going to get docked, you know, they're on a very small wage. They're on about 3,000, 3, 4,000 But, but where's, the, where's the union there? Then when that type of ultimatum is given to workers, isn't that when a trade union is supposed to step in and, and say, wait a minute, you can't do that? 
Yeah, well, I, th I think b with it being so quick, uh, the, the, the union probably weren't able to do anything. Mm. What they were able to do is they were able to gather, gather the people together on the weekend. That's what you find in Bangladesh is that it's only on the weekend is when you see all the protest movements and things like this happening. Very much like in, in Europe as well, you know, you don't see people protesting through the week. They'll always protest at the weekend because they have jobs and things like that to go okay. to. So, you know, it's, 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 the same, it's the same thing in Bangladesh. But the other thing to keep in mind with the unions is, is that, you know, these workers are very brave to be members of the unions because... Why, why is that? Because you're, if, when, you, when you start becoming a member of the union, you, the, these young girls, they start getting intimidated. You know, this is one of the things that we talk about in the film and they, the girls talk by themselves. They get intimidating for being members of the union. By, by whom? By, by, by their the boss? Owner, yeah, okay. by their bosses, mm -hmm. by, the fact, by the factory owners. So, you know, they're taking a, a huge risk to do that. But you're seeing more and more people becoming members because they realize that they need, they need to have their rights protected. And you told me before the show that you are definitely not for a boycott no. of, of garments coming from Bangladesh because there has been talk about what should the consumer mm -hmm. be doing in, in this situation. Um, and why is that? Uh, because obviously a boycott would, would hit the industry in its pocketbook. Yeah, I think the thing is we we work a lot with the National Workers uh, NGWF, which is the National uh, Garment Workers Federation, and uh, the leader of that is Aminul Hakamin, and another organisation we work with is called War on One, and they very we very much agree that a boycott isn't 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 what's needed because. It's, it's more there needs to be changes within the, within, the, within the industry. You know, there needs to be agreements within the factories, fire and building safety agreements, things like this, not a boycott. The fear is, is that if they start boycotting, it, it could be a case that these factories will, these these brands, they'll just leave. They'll just leave the country, go somewhere else, and then just start making their clothing over there. See, the positive thing about the garments industry that industry that it is bringing a huge amount of uh, finances into Bangladesh. But what I think is the the biggest positive thing is is that it's actually. Uh, the the garments industry employs female workers, and now these females, if they weren't working in these factories more than likely, because they're from villages, they would have got married at a very young age, so the, they would have become housewives. So you're seeing, you're seeing positive social change beca positive because social of this changes, industry. Positive social empowering these women. But on the other hand, because in the one hand it's empowering them, but in the other hand they're getting used and abused as well and by the about, factories. What about the Prime Minister of Bangladesh? Mm. I mean, she's a woman. Yep. Um, why isn't she coming up to the plate and, and speaking out for women? She, Most of the employees in these factories are women, like she, you say. I don't know if you've noticed with this one, a factory thing she was very reluctant at first and then she has she has because of public pressure she's come forward now and she was criticized because she waited a day before she, she said anything yeah yeah yeah, yeah. she did. well she probably hoped that maybe it would just you know she I don't think she, maybe she thought that okay there won't be that many people dying right why just because last year remember there was a fire as well you know these things you know they'll get forgotten within a few days but and, this and is that, a, that's the case that is the case mm -hmm. um, outside of Bangladesh yeah. uh, I know for a lot of people I mean the consumer it's always, you know, we hear these appeals to the consumers. Um, but let me ask you, gentlemen, do you think when you buy a shirt, do you actually think about where it comes from or the working conditions? Not, not at that moment, no. I think of it now. I, I ask myself, what, what kind of responsibility do we have here? How, do we share part of the responsibility or guilt or whatever? Is there anything we can do as a consumer? And, and is it fair even to expect the consumer to, to think about these things? No, no I, I just wanted to re-emphasize and support your first point, which I, which I found crucial, that, um, that regardless of the, of the behavior of the international consumers, I think it's, it's also the responsibility of the Bangladesh government. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of uh, bad governance. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it's, if we would have uh, proper building laws and yeah. not only existing but also being implemented, regulations regarding a safe working environment, uh, we would have probably seen a totally different outcome of the of the scenario. Uh, uh, sure.